So, a very warm welcome to all of you. Um, this is the breakout panel session on the plantation industry. So, for those of you who were not planning to discuss plantations, you're in the wrong room. However, I'm assuming and expecting that all of you are here for the right reason. And the main reason is that when we think about the sustainability transition Malaysia needs to go through, we think about how we respond to climate change as a country and as an economy, one of our biggest natural assets we've always talked about has been our natural resources. As a tropical forest country, we live in a place that's blessed with an abundance of sunlight and rainfall. We live with ecosystems that have been converting that into stored carbon for thousands and thousands of years. And as we've developed, we've also built entire economic systems around plantations that do the same thing, with timber, with oil palm, et cetera. So how do we look at the way in which these sectors can deal with the challenges of the climate transition, deal with the challenges of the world ahead of us, and very importantly, what kind of ideas, tools, support are available to help actors in the industry um, address these challenges? So for the panel today, we've brought in a group of colleagues who can share from their perspective both what needs to be done, but also the kind of expertise, experience, resources, and platforms that are available to help our plantation industry make the transition. Now, those of you who've been part of the conference since yesterday know that the organizers talk very regularly about the conference app, which has not only all the information on the panels, the bios of the speakers, but also the ability to ask questions, uh, connect with each other, etc. So, you'll notice, I have not introduced myself extensively. My name is Joseph De Cruz. Everybody calls me JD, and I'm the CEO of the Roundtable on Sustainable Palm Oil. But I'm not going to go into a long introduction, nor am I going to read out the CVs of our very distinguished panelists, because you can find them on the app. And most importantly, you can connect them there so you can continue the conversation afterwards. We have four speakers today, and I'm going to start um, with the timber industry by inviting, I think while I make sure I get my notes right on the sequence, yes, by inviting Puan Sabrina to kick us off with a perspective from the timber industry and I believe also a video that shares a little bit of what we're doing. Entirely over to you, thank you. Assalamu alaikum, good uh, afternoon everyone. Uh, well, it's gonna be a very heavy session after lunch, I believe. But yeah, uh, my name is Sabrina Mawasi. I'm Deputy CEO of uh, Malaysian Timber Certification Council. Yeah, but uh, before I proceed, I think I will share the video that will provide some insight and information about MTCC and also the scheme that we run, Malaysian Timber Certification Scheme.
I think everyone is glued to the video. Basically, that is a crash course of timber certification. How we start is with basically with timber tracking with the system. However, as years goes by, with the requirements set up by the policies by the importing countries, the standard has been tweaked and strengthened and also tightened. So therefore, it's not only timber tracking, but it's now also look into the livelihood of the people within that vicinity, the uh, safety and health uh, issues, and also, of course, the um, documentation and also um, the upgrading of the um, uh, safety and health definitely for the workers because I think previously it's business as usual it's always dollars and cents but now with the sustainability in the pictures they are looking into the economy side the environment side also the social side as well yeah thank you and I think oops thank you and I think that's a, a good illustration of how for all of these commodity plantation sectors expectations of what we we are required to do evolve over time. As you rightly said, starting from a point where it was really only about certification, deforestation free, the expectation that we now need to care about the conditions of our work for our local community. And increasingly now, as we move forward, also the conservation benefits of industries like ours. How are we contributing to climate goals, to biodiversity conservation goals, and others? So I'm going to run through the panel and allow them to give the initial kind of opening thoughts and then open up a conversation. For those of you who can't find seats, please feel free to shove the bags off the chairs in front. One of them is mine, my apologies. So you can just put them down and use the chairs as well. Um, I'm not going to move on actually straight away to Jamat Chahdan from the Malaysian Palm Oil Green Conservation Fund. I got that correct, right? Foundation, thank you. Malaysian Palm Oil Green Conservation Foundation. We'll talk a little bit immediately from the conservation perspective about how the palm industry is um, addressing this issue. Over to you, sir. All right, thank you, JD. Uh, Assalamualaikum and a very good afternoon to everyone. Um, my name is Shahdan. I'm with the uh, Malaysian Palm Oil Green Conservation Foundation, MPOGCF, a bit long but you can call it in short Yayasan or foundation, that's what we are. Uh, can we please have a look at the uh, last page of my slide? The last page. This is a bit long because we have um, currently active tw 20 active projects. So that's quite a number. I will just share a few. Yes, uh, the last, 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 last page. Yeah, this one. Uh, you can see the QR code. You can scan the QR code and uh, it will take you to our website, to our Facebook page, Instagram, or whatnot. And from there, you can read more about, about our activities. So anyway, uh, today, I think uh, from the conservation point of view, uh, perhaps I should share. I mean, MPOGCF is still quite new. Uh, I have to jot this down because if I don't, there are so many things to, to share with you guys, I'm afraid. I might get lost, so. <laughs> all right, so um, first of all, uh, who we are, uh, actually the foundation, uh, we are under the Ministry of Plantation and Community, founded by uh, MPOC, Malaysian Palm Oil Council, and uh, although MPOCF is still considered uh, new, uh, we officially uh, established in 2020, but under MPOC, we have started the conservation work since 2006 under the name of MPOWCF. So it's about the same, but the MPOWCF is a, found, uh, is a fund, a trust fund. So the problem with trust fund is that uh, we don't have enough money. There are so many things to do in conservation. So because of that uh, challenges, challenge, uh, we feel that we need to upgrade M the, the fund into a foundation where when it's a foundation, then uh, financially it's more stable. And when the financial is more stable, we can do more conservation works in Malaysia. Because uh, MPOGCF, we are operating based on uh, SES collected from the industry. Um, I think right now the government is collecting 16 ringgit per ton of palm oil produce. So we get one ringgit from that, it's specifically for uh, conservation purposes. So that also means uh, whenever you purchase your palm oil, uh, please remember, one ringgit will go to will will come to us, and we will use it for conservation purpose, right? So the objective, um, if you look at our website, uh, you can see we have five objectives. 
uh, it's a bit long wordy but uh, basically what we are doing is uh, the first one is on reforestation the second one is on wildlife conservation the third one is on uh, I mean uh, promoting encouraging uh, best practices among the palm oil industry uh, number four is uh, to fund research uh, and number five is to promote uh, all the conservation efforts conducted by us and also by the uh, company in oil palm industry okay so I think today uh, since we don't have I don't have much time I think I will share three uh, main projects that uh, that we are currently doing and this project uh, focusing on uh, helping or assisting the smallholders uh, in combating the climate change, uh, mitigating com com uh, mit climate change, and also to protect the biodiversity that we have in Malaysia. I think the first project that I want to share with you, this is quite uh, a major project that we currently have. It's called the One Million uh, Tree Planting Project. This is in Sabah. Uh, we have, uh, with the help of uh, Forestry Department of Sabah, we have identified 2,500 hectares of degraded area in Ulu Segama Malwa Forest Reserve uh, and this area has been identified as important uh, orang utan and pygmy elephant habitat so what we do in this area is we do replanting we target to plant 1 million forestry species local species fast growing and uh, this project uh, although forestry department is our major partner but we involve uh, the local community uh, there are 68 individuals from a uh, community of Kampung Tempinau that's located near to the, to the forest reserve. Uh, these people, they are going to supply that 1 million seedlings that we're going to plant in that area. And we are currently in phase 3 for this project. And for phase 3, uh, we will need uh, 300,000 seedlings to be planted. And all these 300,000 seedlings will be uh, provided by this uh, local community. So we use the buyback concept. Uh, one seedlings uh, we buy from the community at about seven ringgit. So 300,000, that's 2.1 million ringgit. All 2.1 million ringgit go straight to this community. So they can use that money to, I mean, develop the community, develop the kampung, whatever they want to do. But at the same time, uh, the seedlings that they provided will be planted on the ground. And that, I think, should help to uh, not just uh, provide habitat for the orangutan, but also combating the uh, climate change. I think the second project I want to share is called Achieving Coexistence with Elephant in Sungai Ara. This involves a uh, local community, Felkra community, uh, in Sungai Ara, Mersing, Johor, where in this area we know that they have quite um, serious uh, human-elephant conflict in that area. But this small community of smallholders, they want to change um, conflict into coexistence. So they want to live together with this uh, elephant. They don't want to really you know, disturb the elephant or do harm to the elephant. So they have uh, outreach to us uh, to uh, you know, support them in conservation initiative to, to care for this elephant. So right now what we are doing in Sungai Ara is first to uh, enhance uh, the physical barrier, uh, electric fencing, uh, elephant trenches to, uh, you know, to avoid the elephant from coming in into the plantation area. And uh, we also use technology, we are using drones to actually uh, monitor the movement of the, of the elephant. And I think eventually we want to live together with this elephant because we know that uh, in Malaysia, uh, the, the forest area is limited uh, I mean sometimes uh, even in the forest the elephant are not really you know prefer to be there in the forest they prefer to come into the plantation I think in the future perhaps we are moving towards that uh, coexist to live together with this uh, elephant and in MPOGCF we have uh, launched this campaign called the other Malaysians uh, the other Malaysian is currently focusing on three major uh, species the Malayan tiger the orangutan and the elephant so our goal is actually to coexist with this uh, endangered species. And I think the last uh, project that I want to share with you guys is uh, uh, what we call HCV training, uh, biodiversity assessment. This is to provide training, capacity building for the smallholders because we know the plantation company, they have no issues uh, you know, to, 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 to 
protect, to preserve, to conserve uh, whatever biodiversity that they have in their landscape. But for smallholders, it's a bit uh, challenging. So we are there to assist the smallholders, we provide them training on how to do uh, biodiversity assessment. And once you have the inventory, the checklist, uh, we can come up with uh, procedure guidelines on how to uh, protect and conserve this uh, biodiversity that we have in Malaysia. So right now for these uh, trainings, we have already started. It's a pilot project. We have it in four states, Perak, Pahang, uh, Kelantan and Negeri Sembilan. Uh, in the future, we want to expand that uh, throughout the country. So I guess uh, that's all the time I have to share. So if you want to know more, I think you can keep on showing the, the last page. Just, you know, scan and then you can read more about us there. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, some of you will have seen, and if you haven't already, please check on the app. There's a poll we set out asking what the, the major constraints were that um, limit the ability of especially MSMEs to be able to address the kind of challenges we're talking about. And what Shadan just shared is one of the answers, which is, there are platforms, there are vehicles in our system like Yayasan that can help finance and support the kind of transformations companies need to make in order to become sustainable. So the poll is still live. We haven't closed it yet. Um, the scores are neck and neck, but at this point, the biggest constraint we're seeing is finance. But I encourage all of you to also add your votes in, and then in a minute, we'll close the poll and share the results. With everyone. Now, you were talking just now, Shadan, about some of the work around enrichment planting, the work um, to en enable industries like ours to coexist with the other Malaysians, which is a term I love, by the way, the species we work with. This is also the kind of work that many of the leading companies in these sectors are working on. And our next speaker actually represents one of them. So, Sheikh Nazlan Mohammed, Head of Sustainability at Sawit Kinabalu, I'll hand the floor to you. Thank you. Thank you, Jerry. So, um, Assalamualaikum. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Nazlan Mohammad. I'm the um, head of sustainability from Sawit Kinabalu Group. So, thank you once again for um, inviting Sawit Kinabalu to be a part of this um, uh, interesting uh, event. So, I will start with the um, some introduction with the video. I guess um, the video first, then a few slides for Sawit Kinabalu.
Right. Um, I can see here in, well, in the audience that um, Dr. John Penn is here, one of our partners. Um, um, he's uh, the one actually also responsible on um, setting up our, uh, what we call SPNCA or Sungai Pin Conservation Area. So thank you, Dr. John. <laughs> Okay, my topic will be is um, more on um, um, restoring and also uh, retaining um, existing carbon sink on the um, perspective of cons um, in oil palm plantation. Next slide, please. So we are Sawit Kinabalu. We are the um, the uh, premier arm of um, investment arm of Sabah. We are uh, state JLC of Sabah. And um, next slide. And the vision of the company, of course, uh, we want to uh, not only um, focus on oil palm plantation, uh, oil palm business, but we are also uh, try to diversify ourselves. And um, of course, um, for Sabah and also uh, to support the nation. Our mission, three, uh, three Ps, uh, to create a better environment and also our people to grow and um, of course, sustaining our business commercially. So, like I said, um, we are operated um, all over Sabah, so we divided into four regions. And um, yeah, we are very diversifying company. We have um, cattle integration, we have uh, swiftlet, we have um, durian, we have um, also um, rubber, and uh, you name it. I mean, anything that um, the state's government wanted to invest in or um, in Sabah, we are because because of our land bank, we have around eight thousand hectares of land in Sabah. And in terms of oil palm, we are the third largest. That is around 65,000 uh, planted hectares, soil palm plantation. So, yeah, we, we are the uh, main uh, investment arm of Sabah. Next slide. So, go um, focus on conservation areas. So, in total, we have around 8,000 plus conservation ar areas throughout Sabah. So, the largest conservation areas is in Sungai, Kinabatang, uh, Sungai Pin conservation area, that's in Sandakan. So, if you can see from the, um, the slides, um, we started the project is actually way back in 2000. That's the um, the helicopter photos, of aerial views from the and helicopter, and you can see that um, a lot of improvement has been done until to date, where we actually um, do a lot of uh, restoration work. So as to date, I, I, we have planted almost 800,000 um, um, trees in in these areas. So, like I say, we are actually um, partner with um, Sabah Forestry Department, Sabah Wildlife Department, even the COPEL, the community in Kinabatangan. Nestle also, uh, also supply seedlings to us. Um, uh, Bora, Dr. John Penn is here, uh, give, give us um, a numbers of um, figures um, to be planted. Uh, we have um, receiving fund from IDH. And also Orang Juga, the, um, the, I would call the um, Orang Otan experts. Okay, next slide, please. So this is the area. So in the area, we have um, we have done our uh, wildlife um, assessment back in. I think we have done it twice and let us by 2019. So we di discovered a lot of um, endangered species. For mammals, we have at least 21 species, and uh, nine of these species is actually um, um, is under the IUCN red list. Uh, for birds, I think around 800, uh, sorry, 104 species and 8 of those birds are actually in the uh, IUCN red list. And uh, for instance, if you, um, the hornbill, we have all the hornbills in the Borneo except one. And for plants, uh, next slide. So plants, uh, this is some of the, um, the photos. So even plants, we have at least um, 15, uh, 95 families of flat plant and 22 ICN red list. So as you can see, the, um, we have two hill, Mansuli Hill and also Pongo Hill. We name it because of the, you know, the scientific name of some orangutan Pongo Peck Myers. And um, that, that, that is where most of the um, uh, population of orangutan we found. And what we found that um, from the survey, the um, next across it is actually uh, where the fruits is. So we need to uh, put up a bridge, um, two orangutan bridge, in fact, and for them to actually travel from where they actually live to the next door um, um, across the river 
of which um, most of the, um, the fruits are. And if you want to see a wild orangutan, also wild um, proboscis monkey, you need to, to go, uh, come here because they are, we are not actually um, feeding them like uh, most of the um, rehabilitation center who, of which they actually prepare food for them because we actually want them to really learn how to find food, but we prepare um, uh, uh, um, the figures, like the fruits. Uh, we plant the fruits for them to actually um, at least accessible to them. So Masuli Hill is actually a virgin jungle of which um, uh, where we actually um, uh, decided when, when we decided to, to do the um, conservation area back in 2000. Next slide, please. So oh, this is the, um, the Borneo Orangutan um, bridge. So after six months, we actually um, put up this bridge. So um, eventually, the, um, the orangutan um, trust the, the, the system, the bridge that we pr uh, prepare for them. And also, uh, you can see proboscis monkey. And of, of course, the pig tail macaque, they don't have any trust issues. So straight away, when we put up the, 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 the bridge, straight away, they will use it. OK, next slide. So uh, this is what I, I, I've been talking like. We started the project in 2003. This is something to note that it is not because of RSPO, even though the work started way before even RSPO. Um, so it's not because of certification. It is just uh, when the company, uh, uh, thankfully, I have um, a good um, boss back then. So when we found like, oh, this is an HCV area, I think the word HCV hasn't been, I don't know, John, whether HCV is already started in early 2000s. So I don't know, I, I, I'm a chemical engineer, I don't know. <laughs> but um, yeah, we do it not because of the certification, we do it because this is just the right thing to do. So when we decided like, oh, do we have an area, a high conservation value, and we found that uh, orangutan is inside this area, so we, um, we actually set, um, plan to set aside. So we start with uh, WWF Malaysia, we sign an MOU with WWF Malaysia, because we are a bunch of planters and also engineers, we don't know anything about no conservation. Uh, that's uh, the kick of um, the project. So with that, another big um, project will be um, MOU with uh, in 2017, of which um, 2017 we are actually in this uh, Sabah U Red Plus project, and also we established sensitivity unit for Sawit Kinabalu. And in 2021, we actually put up a conservation area management plan for 10 years. So that this is just to protect. So we don't want the new leaders, most probably I would, maybe I left the company, and somebody crazy enough, they wanted to develop that area. So we put up a management plan so that we could actually protect and know what we want to do for the next uh, 10 years. So next slide. And another big project is actually we, after we have um, those in um, Sungai Kinabatangan, so we have another one in um, uh, Bagaha Corridor. This is where we discovered that um, a riparian buffer can act as an um, connectivity between the movement within uh, wildlife, especially orangutan, uh, between Tabin Wildlife and also, an, um, I think that's um, Silabukan Forest Reserve. So this is just um, around 60 hectares, 57 hectares. So this one we work with um, WWF. And of course, um, they have spent a lot, um, almost one million, to actually support this um, project. Hopefully, one day we could actually also get fund from the, um, the <laughs> Green Foundation. So uh, we have um, put up a five years plan for this, and so far so good. And the um, honourable um, EU ambassador came to this place, and yeah, I think he tweeted about this, and so uh, one of the big projects for Sawi Kinabalu. Next. Oh, that's, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, actually, yeah, a round of applause is good at this point. Am I the only one feeling really cold in here? No? Okay. Could I ask the ashes, could you guys open the doors for a little while, please? Um, so that you can let a bit of... It's, it's a ridiculous thing to do in a climate-focused... Con I know I'm getting eye rolls from people in the room, but I'm really sorry. The room is freezing cold, so we're going to waste energy by letting the air out. Hopefully that also gives us a bit of energy to get past the post-lunch um, dip. We've talked so much about the way in which plantation companies, actors in the industry can respond to the need for prioritizing conservation, funding it, investing in it, 
actually doing the work on the ground. And yes, you're right. I know a lot of this work happened long before the RSPO existed. We're not taking credit for it, except when you're not looking, in which case I will take credit for it. Um, but we also wanted to talk a little bit about the other, other Malaysia, the human dimension, of this, um, and particularly the way in which we can work with, encourage, champion smallholders to also embrace this kind of an approach to production. So our last speaker on the panel before we open for the conversation um, is Professor Atta. Can I give you the floor to talk a little bit about the smallholders? Thank you, Jenny. Yeah. And as you do that, a last call, anybody who wants to vote on the poll online as to what the primary um, constraint is, because I'll use that to try and frame the discussion afterwards as well. Over to you, Professor. Okay. Thank you, Jenny. Uh, a lot of good discussion here, a lot of good presentation. The video was really nice. <laughs> so we talked about certification, conservation. Uh, let me introduce myself first. I'm Asad. I, I teach right across the street. So there is a school of business here, Asia School of Business. Um, so my area is supply chain management. And I'm trained as an optimization guy, operations research. So somehow all of that worked very well to land in the field of sustainability. And um, I'm here to share a little bit about uh, the sustainability project that we are doing with the smallholders, the independent smallholders specifically. So, um, so this slide talks about the Asia School of Business. I mean, you're welcome after the conference to walk right across, take a tour. It's an amazing building out there. Uh, it's a collaboration between Magnigaro Malaysia and uh, MIT Sloan School of Management, established in 2015. And the center, the Center for Sustainable Small Owners, which I lead and I'm going to talk about, uh, it's hosted in the Asia School of Business, is funded by Procter & Gamble Company. And uh, lately, we have other sponsors also joining in, Tomase Foundation from Singapore. Uh, the, m the mission of this center is primarily to safeguard the interest of the independent smallholder farmers. You know? So sometimes we don't talk about them. We talk about smallholders. When I read literature, it's a lot about smallholders, but Specifically, when we want to talk about smallholders which are not scheme, which are not connected, which don't have any contractual obligation with an email or anyone else, uh, there's very little that is available. So this project that I'm going to talk about is about independent smallholder farmers. Um, and this is, uh, so what's the oil palm dilemma I'm talking about here? Um, we all know it grows, oil palm grows in 20 degrees north and south as we just heard this region is also the richest region. About 80% of the world's species are hosted in, these, in this belt. So this poses immense pressure when commercial palm oil expansion pushes into this area. The, the impact is also massive okay? because it's very heavily biodiverse. So, so how do we deal with this? You know? And um, ironically, when we talk about oil palm, one of the interesting findings is that today our yield levels are much below what actually is possible. You know? The smallholders are 12 to 15 metric ton per hectare per year. Malaysian national average is around 20. Uh, the bigger plantations produce 30, 35 metric ton. Labs have shown results of more than 45. And theoretically, in a very controlled environment, I'm aware of results reaching 65, 70 metric ton per hectare per year. But let's talk about what's practically feasible. So it's demonstrable 40, 45 metric ton. And now we are in the independent smallholder domain talking about uh, 14 to 15. In our area, it's about 14.6 metric ton per hectare per year. So, uh, so we have worked with these independent smallholder farmers. Uh, it's a journey, uh, keeping in these three pillars of sustainability. Uh, the people, planet, and prosperity. And what has helped here is reaching out to the industry, you know, the multinational corporations, which are at the very downstream end of the supply chain, using it. Uh, they are the consumers. And uh, making a case to them that, you know, what happens upstream uh, is also very much driven with what happens downstream. So how can we create a business case, which is a win-win, with all these different stakeholders in the supply chain? Can we... Move to the next one. Okay, so how do we do this? Um, these are our overarching goals. We are trying to empower communities in the process by having these independent smallholder associations. Uh, you can 
understand that in a way we are trying to take some of the independence away by managing it, okay? And that's where uh, certifications like RSPOs, RISS comes in handy, which is a, a way of grouping them together to get them certified uh, versus a unit certification to the new standard which came in 2019 really helped and, and became the channel and the motivation to bring them together. Uh, but complementing it, our, our effort doesn't stop there. Complementing it, we are having a business case for livelihood improvement. And when we say livelihood improvement, we are tying it with yield intensification, you know, which I mentioned earlier. So how do we do certification in a way that you are on a journey where you, you get done with certification, but you look ahead and you say, oh, I want to reach the next milestone. How can my yields also improve? So a lot has been done um, in the bigger plantation domain, uh, a lot of study in terms of what are the standard good agricultural practices which are proven to improve yields, but much little is available for the independent smallholder domain. So we have to really find targeted GAPs which will work because cost becomes an issue. Some of that work goes in into the research part. Okay, um, so uh, can we move on to the next one, please? Yes, I think you have to keep, keep hitting. Okay, so first thing first, we, we, have to, we have to make a commitment, okay? That we are going to do this, okay? And uh, what I'm going to show, it can't do it alone. That, that has been our learning. Okay, that has been the, actual, the, the takeaway from this journey as well. It comes out naturally as a shared responsibility. There are so many stakeholders all across, and if one person is trying to champion it, uh, even if they have the potential, they can't go very far. So um, the next slide shows the, 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 the journey of the fruit, or in other ways you can say it's a supply chain map. So if you look in the top left uh, northwest corner, that's where the independent smallholder farmers are, very upstream, secluded, okay, in one part of the supply chain. And they go in Malaysia through the collection centers, through the bigger super dealers who are the ones who are having account in the mills. They can't directly supply to the mills because the mills are huge. So they can't take the smaller, very small uh, supplies. They need aggregators in the middle. From the mills, you get the CPO, but then the kernels passed across CPKO. Uh, is produced from the kernel crushing plants, from where they go to the oleochemical plants. So if you see the journey of the fruit itself, the FFB changes to CPO, CPO to kernel, CPKO, oleine, streline, greaseline. So how do you trace it? You know, what are you trying to trace and how much you want to trace? Okay, so if you ask any of these stakeholders, they all have a different take on what is it they want, what are they tracing and how far up they want to go. Okay, so... So it took us a few years to get to that simple, so-called deceptively simple map. Okay. So who do we work with? Um, um, so independent smallholder farmers, of course, but it's enabled by universities who are good. We are, we are, I'm also trained as an engineer. Uh, I, I'm an optimization guy. I have a field team which, uh, which are in anthropology and uh, consultant agronomists that we have and a bunch of folks from everywhere. So we are partnered with different public universities who help us uh, in the domain. Our area is right now, uh, we have about 5,000 farmers in the area of Wadupahat, Pontian areas of Johor district, that's where we're working. Uh, we have uh, multinational companies who are partnering with us. Uh, we have uh, worked with from the NGOs in the past. Uh, so smallholders look small, but we talk about 40% here. And then this number, which I had on the previous slide, 16.7% is the independent smallholder farmers within the 40% in Malaysia. And that number is growing, you know. But the system is not designed the way it is to take care of them. The mills are huge, and the huge mills uh, will require bigger players to supply, and so that forces a lot of intermediaries to come into the uh, play. And how do we help this entire ecosystem? Because they don't feel motivated to go ahead and do anything that kind of hits them back. So this, what you're seeing, is the sustainability journey, the different pieces we put together. It was a very iterative process across many years, where we started with, so earlier we had siloed initiatives, one initiative to improve the yield, one to get certified and compliance, one to go and engage. So this is the cleaner version, where we start with traceability, we go for certification, we try to get them to improve the yields, livelihood improvement, and then what happens then? You have to continue to do the good work. So that's a very important part, continuous improvement. And after that, what happens then? 
there has to be something always moving forward. So that's what we call, uh, we have an initiative called Diffusion, where you are supposed to be the champion of this program and diffusion or creating impact is your responsibility. So all those farmers who move through this journey come back. That's the closing the loop. So on the next slide, I actually put the way it happens. Um, okay, so if you can click on that, uh, I think there's a small animation there. So while I showed it, um, on, the, on the right side, you need to click that. So on the, while I showed it, it's a linear path. It's actually, uh, I think you need to go back and click on the, yeah, the right-hand sustainability journey piece. Yes, okay. So that's the traceability. Uh, you get to know where things are. You get the NDPE done. You take them to certification. That whole loop goes through the livelihood improvement. Then, then your next steps into continuous improvement. And then these farmers become the ambassadors, bringing in more farmers into this whole ecosystem. So that's why we talk about impact, inspire, and empower. And that also kind of motivates us. And, and we go through different challenges in the beginning. Uh, everything is easy. Green fields, you need to work. But when you have farmers coming in, how do you keep them engaged? So that's what this project is about. Um, Next, I'll show you some, some numbers. I won't go through all of them. So as of today, in the last, uh, from when the 2019 RISS standard was approved, the first batch of 107 farmers uh, was from our program. They got certified as the first batch. Uh, they had a premium uh, in the next year, 2021, 2021 about uh, 50,000 ringgit or 11,000 US dollars, which was all disbursed back to them. As of today, last month, we got 407 farmers certified. We are trying to reach 640 by the end of this year. And by the end of this year, we will have a premium of around 150,000 dispersed back to these farmers. So, so with that, I'll, I'll, I'll stop there. Um, uh, the message is it's not easy. And especially if you're trying to retrofit, uh, it becomes much more difficult. Okay, So how do we? take it further, are there lessons learned? Uh, I'll leave it Thank you. to JD and we take it from here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor. Um, and thank you, colleagues. I think when you listen to the different dimensions that have been shared, um, it becomes obvious that helping small and medium enterprises in the sector transition in the way they need to is a very complex problem. You're dealing with the human dimension, you're dealing with the people dimension, you're dealing with the ecosystems and the livelihoods dimension, the nature dimension, as well as the climate emergency that overarches all of this. In the poll, we ask the question, what's the biggest constraint? What inhibits medium and small enterprises from making this change? And of the 33 answers, 14 people picked financing. So for the discussion and the little bit of time we have before our organizers kick us out of the room, which they won't do, um, I'd like to focus a little bit on that question of financing and also throw the discussion open to all of you as a group. What are the biggest constraints and what are the ideas, examples, opportunities that you're aware of that allow us to unlock financing for medium and small enterprises to make these kind of sustainability transition? Um, I'm going to open the floor right now for anyone who has ideas, suggestions or questions to offer. I also know a few of you in the audience who have expertise in this area. So if nobody volunteers, I'm going to start volunteering people. But let me throw the floor open, and immediately there's a hand at the back already. I'm going to just come over to you, because I'm not sure where the mics are. If you could quickly introduce yourself, but also just keep the conversation going so we don't lag too much. Thank you. Thank you, JD. Uh, my name is Marina Young. I'm a director on ProForest, and I'm also a governor on the uh, Asian Institute of Corporate Governance. I'd like to throw out an idea to the panelists and see what you think about this. And it has to do with governance. And governance does require accountability. And I'm really you know, thrilled to hear some of the numbers that um, the panelists have been putting out in terms of the conservation areas that you are doing now, as well as in terms of the smallholders and, in fact, the uh, production yield per hectare. You know, I, I'm really quite surprised to hear about that potential 60%, uh, sorry, 60 metric tons per hectare yield. And 
I was only familiar with maybe about upper 30s, so it's interesting to hear about 60 plus metric tons. So this brings me to the concept of a target. And I think we can't really achieve much if everybody is working in their little silos and we don't have a single target that we're heading towards. And I'd like to say that this target marries the concern of TCFD and TNFD. So you want to tackle the climate issue with the biodiversity issue. So for example, we set something like a 345 target. What do I mean by that? That would be a 3% in average yield uh, improvement and a 4% rewilding of your planted area in five years, for example. I'm just throwing out numbers here. You could try a 3, 4, 10 if you, if you think five years is too much. Uh, you know, it's too, too much pressure on, on your profits or something like that. But you need to have a target. Without that target, where are you, <coughs> excuse me, where are you heading? And when you have your public engagement with your critics, you have nothing to put forward except these isolated projects that you're doing in SPNCA, which is wonderful, and as well as you know what uh, MPOGCF is doing. It's wonderful, but you only have these isolated things. You don't have a singular target right, for the entire nation. So that's something I would suggest, and I would like to hear the opinion of the panelists. The other th second one, which I would like to throw back at the panelists, as well, is the funding. And I think we have to get a little bit creative with funding. So all of you have heard about blended financing, isn't it? Yeah, where the government puts in a little bit of money and then you source from the private sector or multilateral or unilateral aid organizations for the rest of the funding. And I think that's highly doable now because there are a lot of countries out there who are willing to put money into projects like this. And so, you know, one prime target would be the EU. I mean, they've put up the deforestation law. So if the Malaysian government puts up about 20% funding, and then the big boys in plantation here, the big boys, they put in another 10 to 15%, and then you get Unilever, et cetera, to put in another 10 to 15%, then the balance 50 to 60% would come from a syndicated fund that is EU-based. So. That's potential um, idea that I, I would think that you could then pour into the smallholders. Okay. Brilliant. Thank you. While the panel are pausing to think about that, I'm going to look around quickly and see if there are any other needed questions, comments. Just to say on the idea of blended financing, while the industry doesn't talk about it in that particular language, you see a lot of this in practice where downstream companies are already investing in conservation initiatives like the work that's being done in Johor and elsewhere. It's not an unfamiliar idea. How we scale that up, how we structure that to really unlock large amounts of financing so we can transition the entire sector, I think is the question you're asking. So that's a really interesting one. Um, folks, any questions, reactions to that? Whoever wants to go first. And I promise this won't be only a Sawit discussion because I was scolded for this becoming too oil palm. Hello. Okay, um, to respond on, because SPNC is mentioned, so we start with targets. Um, initially, when we start this project, of course, the target was to conserve, okay? And when we work with our partners, especially sub-forestry department, that is where we know about this um, total protected areas target, of which Sabah has, has this target of um, having total protected areas of 30%, so we are at 26%. So we were thinking like, okay, maybe we could, could add up um, some of these private conservation projects uh, to be you know, achievable for Sabah to get our 30% of total protected areas. So we come up with oh, whether it is possible for us to register as in OECMs. So, but unfortunately, I think uh, Malaysian government hasn't, I don't know, uh, I, I saw Surin there. <laughs> Surin should know better. Um, on OECM, whether it is, I, I think it's not yet in, in Malaysia. So that's one on, on the target. On the, um, the funding, of course, um, well, yeah, we do need a lot of funding. But in, in, in Sabah, we have also this project, what we call a jurisdictional approach project, of which um, we want to certify the whole states of Sabah to be RSPO. And we have this 
I mean, this is very premature to even mention here, I don't know. But um, we have this idea of which maybe we could actually get this fund from the states of Sabah because we are having 1.6, 1.7 million hectares and producing a lot of um, uh, CPOs. So uh, Sabah, we have this Sabah sales tax, but we need to get the, um, the of course, the state's um, approval whether we could actually get at least even half a percent or whatever Sabah sells, or even lower than that, um, to, to get all this conservation area to be funded. And not only on conservation area, but towards um, certification of RSP or jurisdictional approach. So maybe that's from Sabah. Thank you. Thanks. I was really hoping you'd jump in first, because I think if there was one state in Malaysia where you could package a large-scale transformation like this, Sabah would be one of the early moves. Right. Um, just opening the floor, and I think I sent Surin one to... Uh, since my name was mentioned, uh, Surin Proforus, and um, because you mentioned OECM, so I think there is some potential for those who are not familiar. OECM is other effective conservation measures, and if you look at the CBD targets, if you've heard of the 30 by 30 target by conserve 30 percent of the world's terrestrial area and also 30 percent of the green areas as protected areas, the OECM areas can count that target, and traditionally. Conservation areas have been managed by government. But there's now a growing recognition that plantation, plantation sector, the private sector can also contribute to national targets for conservation areas. So you have high conservation value areas within plantation areas. If they can be recognized as OECM, then they will count towards the national target. So I think that, I mean, still early days, but if the government hits that direction, then potentially some funding can go to the plantation companies that are protecting conservation areas and contributing to Thank you. And while I look around the room for others who want to add to the conversation, shameless plug for the RSPO partnership globally, we have over 600,000 hectares of conservation areas managed and financed by RSPO certified growers. So, it, you know, collectively, this is actually a significant input into how we are conserving forests. And the financing question now is how we can unlock that as actually a revenue stream, given all the finance climate coming around. Yes. Yeah, hi. My name is Navonil. Uh, what I wanted to know was now there are new forms of, you know, sort of value creation that's happening. So carbon credits is, is a whole new dimension. And, and I think that sort of creates an economic, uh, you know, value creation from, you know, uh, forestation efforts which potentially can then fund the efforts and grow it. So I would, would love to get some views from the panel of, is that something that you all see as an add-on in terms of value creation? Yes. Um, why don't we just add one more and then I'll turn back to the panel. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> sorry, excuse me. Um, uh, hi, good afternoon. I'm Charmaine from Forest Stewardship Council Malaysia. Trying to... Yeah. <laughs> so um, FSU has about... Uh, I think close to 180 million certified forests all around the world. And our standards actually require a minimum of 10% to be conserved. So we have about 17 million hectares of uh, conserved areas. So this also applies to smallholders, but they're grouped, so it's easier. Thank you. I want to put you on the spot. Hello, by the way. Um, did you want to talk a little bit also about how in the FSE standard, the embedded carbon question is being addressed? Or is that too much, too much detail to get into? The question was asked about carbon and how we actually optimize the management of carbon in these supply chains. So before we get to the palm side, I wondered whether one of you wants to talk about how that's being addressed in the context of um, the timber supply chain. You want to take that? Um, yeah. yeah, about this uh, carbon um, sequestering, yes, this is something that uh, we have been looking into as well because uh, for MTCS, it's actually endorsed under PSC, the Programme for Endorsement of Forest Certification, right? Uh, it's the same, I mean, uh, at par as with PFC Interna FSC International. So, um, yes, this is in, in discussion that might be go into the standard that once the inter international level has adopted, definitely it will flow through the local uh, standard as well. So definitely that is one of the uh, hot topics we've been discussed and we definitely see that's going to be uh, included in the standard. Yeah. Thank you. I'm going to check. Sorry. Yeah, so, so just very briefly, FSE has a carbon monitoring tool. We also have ecosystem services um, verification, which means 
you can actually verify the uh, carbon potential of a uh, FSC certified forest. Uh, we have also signed an MOU with Vera for double tagging. So they are using our standards to see how um, we can also be used. At the moment, we don't um, have any sort of uh, programs that is related to carbon credits, but we can definitely verify carbon claims, the carbon potential of an FSC certified forest, basically. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'll add a quick note on that while I'm looking around the room. Uh, Daniel, oops, he ran out. I was going to ask and see when they're going to kick us out of the room. Um, but until somebody comes along, I'm going to give us a bit more time. I think without going into too much of the detail here, even in the palm space, there's a very active conversation about the carbon embedded within palm as a supply chain. Recognizing that palm as a product um, ultimately derives from sequestered CO2 from the, from the atmosphere. I think the message for a lot of people in the industry is increasingly we need to be able to look at carbon, not just as a compliance challenge, but as a market opportunity because there's such a huge demand in the world to figure out solutions for how we demonstrate with sequestering carbon. So whether this is the conservation areas within our landscapes, whether this is the embedded carbon, being able to, to document and audit and trace the embedded carbon within our products, these are, I think, areas that will over time become more tangible revenue streams for the industry, especially if we can use that as a way to blend finance, as I mentioned a moment ago. So I do suspect at some point an organizer is going to come in and force me to stop this conversation. Oh, Tarek's saying we have to stop. But maybe I'm going to take one last, if there's any last perspective, particularly ideas around financing and, and where the evolution of this could go in the future to particularly support smaller, medium-sized growers. If anyone has a last um, observation on this, I'd be very happy to take a a final word, or if not, um, yeah, one last thing, sure. Just for the benefit of, of maybe RSBO as well, so I really agree with looking at the value chain, for example, our smallholder rubber planters in Thailand, we've got um, in total about 200,000 hectares certified at the moment, and that was actually driven by Pirelli. Pirelli launched the first FSC certified tire in 2021. Um, so they started off with Thailand and now they're going to Indonesia and possibly coming to Malaysia as well and helping our smallholders. So they actually pay a premium and they've also cut away the middleman. So the premium goes directly to, to the smallholders. So I think that can work very well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, that's a conversation we can certainly continue. I know there's probably a lot more we could have covered ground on today, but the timing is always a bit too tight. Thank you very much to all of you for being here in spite of the cold. Um, thank you for your contributions and a huge thanks. Please join me in thanking our panelists for their insights. <laughs>